removing or adding to and taking away from what God had said. And he was implanting these things into her, her mind. And this takes us to James, where it says this, Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now lust is a strong desire. So what the serpent was doing to Eve, he was giving her a strong desire. And this enticed her. Then, when the strong desire or lust has conceived, what happens? Then it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Okay? And all this adds up very well with what happened in the garden with Eve. But Adam is before her now, being presented with this fruit. And without further information that the Bible adds to this story later in the book of Romans, one would think of a lot of different possibilities that could have taken place. Why, why was Adam... Well, that's what we need to do. We need to go to 1 Timothy 2.14 to see. To see some of the facts about the case. And see what it says. It says this is what it says. And Adam was not deceived. Verse 14. Chapter 2. Verse 2. This is really important right here. Because there's a lot in the story here that's take, that takes place because Adam was not deceived. Point blank. He did not, even though he was present with the serpent, with that with Eve, for him, he didn't he didn't move from the position of truth to error. Okay? This is what always gets me. He didn't move from he didn't move away from the position of truth. Okay? So you can think that, but it was in the uh, concordance says that he was not deluded. And it goes on to say, and Adam was but the woman being deceived was in a transgression. So if this is all we had in the Bible, we would think that Adam took of the fruit to save Eve. Because now God was going to go and do what he was going to do with death and bring it upon them. But without more revelation, we might end up thinking that way. But the other revelation is uh, Romans 519, where it says that, you know, by one man disobedient, by, by one man's disobedience. And so right there, that declaration is just point blank saying, even though Adam wasn't deceived, Did it anyway. he was still in disobedience. Yeah. And that and what all that disobedience had to be God's judgment because God wasn't going to go back on what he told him. Right. That the process of death would begin and you would die. Yeah. Okay? And I, you know, there's just no way to. Uh, it would be nice to know what happened just before, and he did eat. What he was thinking. What was in his mind. He wasn't deceived. Not, 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 not any deception. But he was enticed. Okay? with the prospect of what, of the knowledge of good and evil. He was enticed. Because that's where you have to go back to James. Because I think James applies to both Adam and Eve. Both. Okay, if you can follow that. Through the disobedience of the one man, that's Romans 5.19. Now Adam disobeyed God's one command, now the rest of his life, he'd be learning obedience through suffering. Now in Hebrews 5.8, it talks about our Lord Jesus Christ. It says, yet learn Christ obedience by the things which he suffered. I think it's pretty amazing that Jesus Christ had to learn obedience. It was, he learned it. I think the reason... 
that he did have to learn it was because he took on the body of flesh. And when he took that body of flesh on, that's called a kenosis, and it's not a joke, it's what happened. I've heard people make light of that, and I think it's ridiculous. Don't make anything light of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. But the, the bigger point is this here, is that he's the second Adam, he's the last man, and he's a type of Adam. But he's going to rescue Adam out of what Adam did, and he's going to rescue all of mankind out of that. Uh, overall, with this whole thing, and the, the very, one of the very first stories in the scriptures is this. This is the greatest evil that ever came upon man. And now, death is man's enemy, it's not his friend. So this is the, the biggest evil that came about. Their flesh wasn't sufficient to stop their transgression. So let's move on now to the serpent that was involved in this. There's some strange things about the serpent here. The thing about Satan is this, that he was created to do what he does. There's nothing about Satan being enticed but God created him that way, to, from the beginning. It says in First uh, John 3, 8, For from the beginning is the adversary sinning. In John 8, 44, that he was a man-killer from the beginning. And of course, he was a liar and the father of lies. Now I think the lying part starts with Eve. That he began to do all his lying right, right, right from that. That's the beginning of that. Then who? And then as a murderer, well, he murdered the entire race. Yeah. At first, I confined it to uh, to Abel. That Abel was murdered by Cain through the through the means of the serpent deceiving him to, to hurt his brother. So, with Satan being created as uh, a being that would sin right from the start, and this solves so many problems. But this states the beginning of his creation. No other deduction is possible, but that sin began when he began. There is no flaw in the creation of a creature perfectly adapted to carry out a part of his purpose. And that's what God had done with, with, with Satan. He created him to carry out his purpose, which we eventually be to help mankind. Although Satan doesn't you don't see that in Satan, of, as helping anyone. It's always destruction with him. In Job 26, 13, it says this, By his spirit he hath garnished, this is the King James Version, By his spirit he hath garnished the heavens, his hand formed the crooked serpent. In the Concordant Version it says, By his spirit the heavens were made seemly. His hand travailed with the fugitive serpent. The Hebrew word call refers to the travail which accompanies birth. So what we end up with this verse here is this idea. And it's, this is kind of neat. And I've never heard this before. But God's hand was pained with the travail of bringing forth the serpent. So it actually hurt God to create Satan. Hmm. That's kind of neat stuff, huh? Why Satan the adversary? He supplies the op opposition that is necessary for God to display His wisdom, His love, and His grace. Remember back in the Eden, all there was was everything that God had created, He kept saying that it was good that, through all the days. And, and I don't think He said it on the sixth day when He created man. But He said it for the other days for sure. Now, at, taking from the uh, tree of knowledge of good and evil, now uh, there would be a, a backdrop for God that he could work so that he could manifest himself. And the Bible itself is a, is a manifestation of God. Mm -hmm. I mean, in general. It's God manifesting himself to us through all these stories in Scripture. Now, as far as him creating Satan, there may be people that have a real problem with that. And I think I would too at, at one time until I see that God created evil in Isaiah 45. In John 1, 3, the Bible says that all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In Colossians 1, 16, this is getting more specific. 
For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, were they to be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And, and Satan is a power. He's the chief of the jurisdiction of the air, the prince of the power of the air. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 2 2. So he was created by God that way. And he serves a purpose. In Isaiah 54 16, this is a verse that we could say that it's about Satan, but it's not. I'm going to read your verse about man right now. I have created the waster, Yahweh says, to destroy. The concordant version says this, I created the ruiner to harm. Now what this verse is in reference to is not Satan, but it's men who build weapons of war mm -hmm. and who are warriors. And God has all these things in his power. He formed every man who is engaged in spreading desolation of war. Now, people are taken uh, and deceived by the king of Tyrus. Okay, saying that that was Lucifer and that was Satan. Well, it wasn't. It was a man. It says it point blank in the Bible that he was a man. He's not a, a figure of Satan in any way. They're separate beings. Just like Melchizedek, Melchizedek was not Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Again, it says that Melchizedek was a man in Scripture. So we want to just leave, when it says a man, a man is not God. It can't be. Now let's look at the word evil for a minute here. Translating the word evil, uh, the English renderings of evil are break, displease, ill, harm, hurt, mischief, punish, vex, and wicked in the King James Version. So there's nine different words there. And there's adjectives for the word evil. Adversary, bad, calamity, distress, grief, grief grievous, heavy, ill-favored, misery, not, noisome, sad, sorrow, trouble, wretchedness, and wrong. So there's 16 of those. So, where do we go with the word evil? Can it be translated consistently evil? Well, it could have been. It could have been. Uh, the literal root meaning of evil is this. It describes the effect of iron. Hardest of common metal when used to smash and destroy. So in Psalms 2.9 it's, it's used there. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Them are kings of the earth and, and rulers that are being dashed. As far as the root word is concerned, it has more of the idea, definitely, of break, smash, and pulverize. Okay, that's where we're at with the word evil. You can, you can set those three words and lay it, lay it in there. And we're going to see something about, about the Lord Jesus Christ here as we go down the road, where that is related to Him, which is very interesting. Okay, so what is God's purpose in evil? What does God do with evil? Well, it's Ecclesiastes 1.13. And, and the people who translated this, uh, the Concordant Version, were very careful with this verse. I looked at it. I looked in uh, commentaries and things, and I think they did a great job. Uh, it's like almost completely different than the King James Version. Okay? And we don't have time to discuss that, but I'm going to read it now, and you'll see. This is very plain. And I give my heart... Now, this is a preacher speaking in Ecclesiastes. And I give my heart to inquire and explore by wisdom concerning all which is done under the heavens. It is the experience of evil God gives to the sons of humanity to humble them by it. Hmm. So there you go. That is the primary purpose of evil. In the King James Version, instead of the word humble, it says exercise. Exercise. James, James and Foster and Brown say about this word exercise that it is discipline, literally, that they may thereby chastise or humble themselves. The, another place said, for to afflict them. Uh, the International Standard Version has a, a very simple uh, translation of this, and it's very self explanatory. God uses terrible things so human beings will struggle with life. That's pretty simple, but I think it still hits the nail on the head. Okay. Now, a great
great example of this is Nebuchadnezzar's restoration. Nebuchadnezzar. Now, God, just a little review here. God granted him uh, the right to be king, and he safeguarded his kingdom, and he made him, uh, gave him might, honor, and esteem. He gave him all those things. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar knew Daniel, and that Daniel's God is above other gods, that he is Lord of kings. He had admitted that in the book of Daniel. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was a witness of the fiery furnace. So he's seen something that was fantastic. And Daniel interpreted his dreams when others could not. And Nebuchadnezzar recognized that. But Nebuchadnezzar, kind of, he lost his way with what he had learned. And he ended up exalting himself and saying uh, that God safeguarded his kingdom. He turned around and said... I safeguarded my own kingdom. And he started acting kooky like that. And so what God did was he gave him another dream and then Daniel interpreted it again. And now he was going to be humbled. And so for seven seasons he was going to become like an animal of the field. And this is called lycanthropy. Which means wolf human. Now, if he became a wolf, there would have been a lot more drama in the Bible. <laughs> but he didn't. He just became a, a grass eater. Okay, not a human eater. So he became, uh, he acted like an animal. But, and all that happened with that, it's kind of pretty fantastic that for seven seasons, it humiliated him, it humbled him. But in all that, he thanked God for it after it was done. This is a big point about evil. This evil came upon him that he would be in the field for seven seasons. But when it was all done, he thanked God and it was even recorded what he said. He wanted it to be recorded so others could see. He wasn't ashamed of it. Let's just see what he says about it. And at the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, this is after he was brought back to sanity, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to the heavens, and my knowledge was returning to me. Then I blessed the supreme, and I lauded and honored him, who is living for the eon, since his jurisdiction is an Eonian jurisdiction, and his kingdom is with generation after generation. All those abiding on the earth are reckoned as not, according to his will, he is doing with the army of the heavens and with those abiding on the earth. And there is no one who shall stay his hand and say to him, What have you done? At the stated time, my knowledge was returned to me for the esteem of my kingdom. Also, my honor and my former aspect returned to me. My retinue and my grandees sought me out. I was reestablished over my kingdom and excelling grandeur was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, am lauding and exalting and honoring the King of Heavens. Since all his deeds are verity and his paths are adjudication, and he is able to abase all those walking in pride. And this is really, this, this what he just said right here, is going to be, end, be the end all for all of us. Because whatever happens throughout our lives, in the end we're going to say, Thank you, God, that all these evils came upon me, whatever they were, because of what God is going to do for us in the future. Let's go to Naomi and see her play uh, in the book of Ruth. And with just one verse is all we need. Now, with her, we have to have a little summary, too. So she's in Moab, and her husband dies. And she has two sons. There's two sons married, Moabite women. And they're married for ten years, and after the ten years, the two sons die. And so Ruth and the other lady are without husbands. So Ruth wants to return to Bethel. They're not Ruth, but Naomi wants to go back to Bethel, Bethlehem, where she was from. And... Uh, Ruth wants to go with her because of what she has seen and learned. Now, 
Personally, I think the story of Ruth is more about Naomi than it is about Ruth. People would argue with me about that. But Ruth, uh, Naomi remained faithful in spite of what happened to her losing her husband and her two sons, which were her provision. In Ruth chapter 1, verse 21, it says this about Naomi. I was full when I went out. That is, that when she left Bethlehem, she had her husband and she was happy. Yet empty has Yahweh caused me to return. So it's God who caused her to return empty. Why call me Naomi when Yahweh, he has humbled me, this is a concordant version, and he who suffices, he hath done evil to me. Now in your Bibles, in England, it says afflicted. Calamity. But it says he has done evil to me. Okay, that, that really is the proper translation of this verse. Evil, using the word evil. The, the truth of the matter is, in each story throughout the Bible, evil's going to be in it somewhere. In, in, including the New Testament. Even, this, even though we're in the age of distance, uh, an administration of grace, we're in an evil eon. So evil is always present in every story, somewhere along the line. But here with uh, Naomi, uh, it says this in the King James Version. The Lord hath testified, testified against me. This is one of these, uh, this thing before when we did the Hebrew way of thinking. In the book of Ruth, God does not speak. Yet it says, the Lord hath testified against me. It was because God's word is God's deed. And God's deeds are God's words. Those things, His deeds and words, they're one. They're one thing. So you can have a deed without a word, and a word without a deed, but they're one. And I don't know if you can follow that. It's a phrase commonly applied as far as being testified uh, to a man who gives witness in a court of justice. Testified by word and deed. In, in Rotherham, this is where it gets the word evil is really well translated here. Yahweh, this is what it says, Yahweh hath given answer against me, and the Almighty hath crushed me. This is a, concerning Naomi. The Almighty hath crushed me, is the way they're, they're looking at this translation. That's pretty heavy. Mm -hmm. Okay. The International Standard Version says, The Lord is against me, and the Almighty hath broken me. Now, what's special about Ruth? What is special about Ruth? This is it. She looked back, and she's saying how Naomi still stayed faithful to Yahweh, to Elohim, throughout this whole ordeal with her husband being dying. And then with losing her sons. And, and Ruth is special because the Lord testified against her too. She took, he took her husband. Yet she made a decision that this was the true God. And so she would continue and stay with Naomi, and then there would be more to the story. Basically, Ruth and Job have similar stories. He lost his children and all his possessions. So with Job, we'll go through him very fast, because he's probably uh, the case study in the problem of evil. In fact, uh, some people think that is the theme of the book of Job, is uh, the problem of evil. In, in chapter 2, verse 9 with Job, Then his wife said to him, Are you still holding fast to your integrity? Scorn all of him, all of him, and die. Yet he said to her, Like the speech of some decadent woman are you speaking. Indeed, should we receive good from the one Elohim, and should we not receive evil? And all this Job did not sin with his lips. So Job recognized that evil came from God. And that's what we're trying to stress here. Now Job 42, 11 and 12, I have here read it, so i got to find Job. If anyone else can find it faster than me, you can read it. Job comes before Psalms, right? <laughs> 
Huh? Yeah. yeah, read it. 11 and 12. 11 and 12. Then came to him all his brothers and sisters, and all who had known him before, and ate bread with him in his house. And they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold. And so, I so, oh, go oh, ahead, yeah, read the next verse. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, and he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and then 1,000 female donkeys. Okay, so God did this thing to Job, and by the knee, he blesses them, you know, tenfold, whatever it might be. It's, it's a thing like this here. If I, if I told you uh, to invest a dollar to get a million dollars, would you do it? Sure you would. Mm -hmm. The evil is the one dollar. God's blessing in the end is the million dollars. <laughs> Let's go to probably the best thing to see what God is up to is uh, the story of Joseph. And it's chapter 45 in Genesis. That's some really deep stuff to, to get you here, so let's see if we can continue with this. Now this is Joseph with his 12 brothers, or with his 11 brothers, whatever it might be. Uh, and he's explaining to them, to them what happened you know, with everything that they tried to get rid of him, but it didn't work. At this, Joseph was no longer able to check himself before all those who were stationed by him, and he called out, Have every man go out for me. So no one stayed with them when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He raised his voice in lamentation, and the Egyptians heard it. He, he cried. And Pharaoh's house heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were not able to answer him, for they were flustered at his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Now come closer to me. When they came close, he said, I am Joseph, your brother whom you sold to Egypt. And do not be grieved, nor let it be hot in your eyes that you sold me hither, because Elohim has sent me on before you for the preservation of life. For this is just two years that the famine is within the land, and for five more years there will be no more pine or harvest. But Elohim sent me on before you, set up for you a remnant on the earth, and to preserve lives for you in a great deliverance. So now, not you sent me here, but the one, Elohim. And he hath made me a father of Pharaoh, and a lord over his household, and ruler over the whole land of Egypt. Now, would Joseph do this again for what happened? He was the savior of the world, basically, back in that day, for the house of Israel. Yes, he would have. He would have gone through all the afflictions and all the evil that came upon him to save his brother. Okay, even though they were all jealous of him concerning his dreams. Now, now this story typifies our Lord Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 53.10 says this, in the, uh, so that you'll be familiar, in the King James Version, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Now in the Concord Version it says this, yet Yahweh desires to crush him. That's what it says in the Concordant verse. And he did crush our Lord Jesus Christ Amen. on the cross of Calvary <clears throat> through the suffering and the shame of all of that. It was God who did it for Joseph. It was God who did it. It wasn't the Romans and the Jews, but it was God who did it for mankind. It was God who did it and to such purpose that it was rec that it rectified and justified all other sins. A sin for a sin. Jesus Christ was murdered. That's why unbelieving people think that the crucifixion of Christ is foolishness. It's a murder. They see no redemption in it for mankind. But the result, the crucifixion is the result of Christ's death is the reconciliation of all. Adam's sin made it the cross necessary. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, Christ becomes the sin offering. In Isaiah 53.11, just like we were talking about the idea that would Joseph do this again? 
to be the Savior of the world? Yes, he would. In Isaiah 53, 11 it says, And he shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. And so Jesus Christ was satisfied with what he did on the cross of Calvary, so he could be the Savior of mankind. Now, I have a bunch of propositions. I'm just going to read them to you. And uh, only make one comment about one, one, the very first one here. Um, the beginning's properties, these are for your uh, reflection and thought. God does inflict evil even where no direct blame exists. It's kind of a strange statement, isn't it? But in John 9, verse 2, the disciples ask him this. Who did sin, this man or his parents? And he goes on to say, neither of them. This is done basically so that God can be manifest. Mm -hmm. God uses evil to attain a higher good. Evil is the means God employs in turning his creatures from neutral indifference to an active and affectionate response to his love. Evil came into the world in accord with God's purpose. All these are interchangeable. It's, these are just propositions that I was getting as I was researching this and, and writing them down. God uses evil in his operations. The key to all evil in the world is this. It's due to the insubjection to God. God is competent to cope with evil and cast it out at the consummation. God is responsible for all evil. This is what people don't like to hear. But he is responsible for all evil. Let me just stop between these things right now. Men do evil deeds. In fact, there's even a verse in the Bible that outright says that. And men do evil. But the thing about men, the difference between God and men is that men can't control the situation. They can't control the outcome of what happens with the evil. But God can control the outcome. And he does control it. God will bring good out of evil. Evil is not unique to the chosen people of Israel. Evil serves God's purpose towards him being all in all. Evil comes to us from God our Father like chastisement does. God brings and removes evil. Evil occasioned the conditions and circumstance through which God reveals himself. There could be no manifestation of love apart from evil. I have two more thoughts here. This is going to be a quote from uh, Valdemar Lesnoff, and this is just two separate paragraphs here, uh, just a sentence or two, but this is really good. This is excellent. This guy was incredible, it's Mr. Lesnoff. The evils of earth were born in heaven, that they have their origin in and take place in consonance or agreement with the counsel of the Most High. God sent evils for a specific object to quicken and develop moral qualities, sharpen their sensitiveness, free them from subservience to temporal interests, in order that man, in the joyous consciousness of perfect freedom, might find satisfaction in God alone. Man, that, that's some awesome stuff right there. Yeah. I should write it in my Bible, I guess. <laughs> in Romans 8, 18, it says this, For I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And that's what it comes down to. The sufferings of this present time are not going to be worthy of what God does for us in the future. For all, not just us, but for all mankind. Imagine incorruption. Right now we are filled with corruption. But in the future, when we're vivified and made alive beyond the reach of death, we will have incorruption. We'll not sin because we'll be so energized with what God gives us, that he'll keep us from that. Because we'll have already experienced sin and be tired of it. You've heard me in the past say in sermons that I'm tired of sinning. I try to find my way to get past that, but because of the flesh, there is no way past that. But God has given us the, the, his spirit so that we can walk after the spirit. And of course, that has to be learned. And there's this great lesson of evil that God has in the scripture is for all mankind.
Okay, comments? Any uh, reductions or redactions or whatever the word is? Uh, anything? Yes, yes. So, God created evil. Did he know that we're going to be evil? He created evil, and he knew we were going to be sinners. Yes, he did know that. But it's the manifest, because he's manifesting himself, so there's a contrast between good and evil. Otherwise, if he would have just made man perfectly, we would not appreciate his love and who he is. But because we're, uh, he's put us in a, a habitation where evil exists, now we can appreciate what God has done for us. We can, this appreciation is right now. But in the future, when we see the whole plan worked out, everything will really appreciate it. And we'll be drawn in completely. Is there anything else, Ted? Any thoughts on this? <laughs> <laughs> well, on the sixth day, God did say it was good. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Genesis 1. I just don't remember. One was ten. Ten. He said it was very good. You, you, made me go, you made me go check that out. <laughs> <laughs> I just, my memory is not there. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, what, what, what belief surpasses all other beliefs of human destiny? The belief of the salvation of all mankind. It surpasses all other beliefs of human destiny. All right. Yeah. Yes, Ken. Uh, I think the point we, we need to understand is that this evil drives us to Christ. Keep, that's what you're saying. Right. right. It's driving us just to a like, deeper just, relationship with Him. Just like the law was supposed to drive yes. Israel yes. to Christ. Yeah, because even Same in Romans way. 7, the last verse is, I think, He's thanking God for the victory He has in Christ. Right. Even though He couldn't find out how to do what He wanted to do. You know? Right.